Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Monday Morning Introduction to Philosophy and Theory live stream lecture. My name is Julian, and I am so glad that you are here. In case you're wondering what these live streams are about, before I began making videos online, I used to work as an academic at the University of Oxford Brookes, and before that, at the University of Kent. Now, when the pandemic forced our university to close, I decided to start hosting free open access live stream philosophy lectures for my students online. Back then, we were a group of about 10 to 15 people. And in the past two and a half, almost three years, this group has ballooned into a global community of philosophy and theory enthusiasts. And so if you're joining me today, welcome. Welcome to our learning community. This is going to be a 45 minute lecture, essentially a graduate level philosophy lecture, quite academic in nature, on the Hegelian dialectic. This is an ongoing lecture series that I've been hosting now for a while, which is titled The Cunning of Reason, and it functions as a guide or an introduction to Hegel, both for complete beginners and people who have a little bit more experience. I see that we are joined from around the world by Let's see, someone coming from Colorado. Please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining us from. I see someone from Egypt. Hello, wonderful to hear from you. Greetings back to Egypt from London. I am still in London uh, where I'm going to be for a couple more weeks and enjoying it very much. Uh, I see someone from Oregon. Hello, Oregon. Now, if you're curious about joining these classes more frequently, I also post all of my lectures as audio downloads to my Patreon where you can also download the Complete Guide to Zizek, which is an ebook compilation that I've put together that consists of the previous eight ebooks that we've released for these lectures. The basic model is that every three months I start a new lecture series and release an accompanying ebook. And on Patreon, you can download all of them. And by becoming a patron, you also help me keep these lectures open access and free. And so if you'd like to become a patron, simply go to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. Of course, you can also join for free. I see someone joining us from Frankfurt. Hello. It's wonderful that you are here. This is going to be a 45 minute guide to Hegel lecture in which we're going to go deep into the topic of the Hegelian dialectic and specifically the Hegelian theory of the cunning of reason. Uh, if you want to follow all the lectures, if you want to catch them, you can find them saved on Instagram and also on my YouTube. Okay, so let's dive right in. This is going to be uh, a, a intro to Hegel lecture series building upon the previous ones that we've already done. Now, for those of you who have followed this lecture series thus far, you will know by now that I refer to Hegel as a dialectician, as someone who has a dialectical theory of history which he also refers to as the cunning of reason. And in this lecture, I would like to explain a little bit more carefully what Hegel actually means by the dialectical movement of history. Because if we simply describe it as the dialectical unfolding of reason or the subjective knowledge of spirits, the transition from Verstand to Vernunft, that is very abstract. And so what I want to do today is give you a couple of examples that will hopefully give you a little bit more clarity as to the functioning and the movement of the Hegelian dialectic, a term which Hegel himself uses very sparingly. Now, one way to understand the Hegelian concept of the dialectic is to actually see it as being quite closely related to Hegel's view on Christianity. In fact, I want to start this lecture by suggesting that we can find the perfect illustration or close to perfect illustration of the Hegelian dialectic in one of the parables of Thomas, in the Gospel of Thomas. But first, let's begin with some of the other parables of Jesus. Essentially, we can find a triad, a triad of parables about the kingdom of heaven that in their triadic structure suggests a dialectical unfolding of the idea of history. The first being the parable of the mustard seed. Now, the parable of the mustard seed is relatively straightforward. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a mustard seed, which in and of itself is one of the smallest seeds. And yet when it is planted, it grows into one of the largest plants. In other words, the simple parable of the mustard seed is that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. You plant it, 
and then you nurture it, you grow it, and over time it grows into something that reaches into the heavens. It's a simple parable that lays out, if you will, a formula or a formal structure for the idea of the kingdom of heaven being something that is small, that grows into great size over time. In other words, something that starts at zero, if you will, and makes a temporal progression into something much greater than how it began. This is, if you will, the first proposition as to the nature of the kingdom of heaven. It's a formal proposition by which we have a linear trajectory or a linear movement towards the kingdom of heaven. Now, the second parable, the second parable is quite interesting as well, is the parable of the leavened bread. And the leavened bread is again a parable about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is likened to yeast, which is introduced into flour. And this yeast creates a process of fermentation by which you have what would today be referred to as a sourdough loaf. In other words, we have the plain, ordinary material stuff of flour with, to which water and yeast is added that then grows into something very nourishing, something very necessary for life. And this is the second parable when it comes to the idea of the kingdom of heaven. And so we've gone from the kingdom of heaven being a mustard seed, something very small, which grows into something large, towards the idea of the kingdom of heaven being something that is equated to yeast, something that creates organic growth, that turns flour into something life-giving, something nourishing. Again, we have here a formal proposition, not simply from zero to something, from seed to beautiful plant, but rather a living organism that is added to flour to then create bread. The formal structure here is therefore no longer that we have a temporal finite movement from something being very small, a seed, towards the growing of a plant, but instead we have the living stuff of the fermentation process by which something new or excessive, a plus one, is generated. In other words, we have here a very different formal proposition. When it comes to the mustard seed, we essentially have something that is already complete in its nature. In other words, in the seed, we already have the genetic structure for what will become the mustard plant. And all that has to be added to this is light and water, and it will grow into what it already was. For those of you asking why my face is a bit sweaty, my face is sweaty because it is very warm today. It is in the 20s, and I have just stepped outside of a hot shower. So apologies for that. Uh, it is a very, very warm day in London today. Now, the formal structure in the first one is therefore that we go that something is already fully complete in its nature. The seed simply has to grow. Whereas in the secondary version, we have something which requires the introduction of yeast. And what's so important here is that the introduction of the yeast is therefore likened to the kingdom of heaven. It's not that the flower is the kingdom of heaven. It's that when you introduce the yeast, you have a organic chemical process of fermentation that takes place that is likened to the kingdom of heaven, which is a very different proposition from a, formula, from, a for, uh, from a formative or formal structure. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. And again, I'm gonna take off my jacket real quick because it is very, very warm today. Uh, we're somewhere in the mid twenties and I made the mistake of taking a very warm shower today which is probably not a very good idea. So I'm gonna take off my jacket, if you'll just give me one moment. Okay, here we go. So the third parable that I wanna discuss is a parable that we find not in the ordinary canon, but that we find in the Gospel of Thomas, which is therefore non-canonical. And yet, fundamentally, in the Gospel of Thomas, we see a parable that is perhaps the most dialectical in nature, perhaps even the most Hegelian in nature, although it precedes and predates Hegel by, by quite a bit. And this is the parable of the empty jar. Now, the parable of the empty jar works like this. Essentially, we have a woman. So first of all, the, the question is, what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the definition of the kingdom of heaven? 
and we have a woman who's carrying a jar above her head. And what she doesn't realize is that there is a little hole, a crack in the jar. And so as she carries the jar, it is slowly emptying behind her. I don't remember exactly what was in the jar. I think it's like wheat or flour or something. And so as she walks along with the jar on top of her head, she doesn't realize that she's leaving a trail behind her. And at a certain point, she arrives at her destination. And once there, she realizes that the jar is empty. And this empty jar, according to the Gospel of Thomas, this empty jar is the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's an interesting parable, and it's often confounded interpreters because this would seem to suggest, therefore, that the kingdom of heaven is empty. How can you liken the kingdom of heaven to an empty jar? One of the rationalizations that certain scholars have made, theologians, is to suggest that the kingdom of heaven is the full jar and that you have to be careful to preserve it because otherwise you will slowly lose it until it is empty. And yet nothing could be less true if you think about it. The parable of the empty jar is a proposition about the dialectical nature of the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. As the woman empties the jar, the jar is being filled. But what is it being filled with? Well, it's being filled with nothing, essentially. In other words, the more the jar empties out, the more it is filled until it is completely empty. And at that point, it is full. It is full of nothingness. In other words, this emptying out so as to become full, this dialectical, seemingly contradictory proposition by which the filling in of the kingdom of heaven is precisely the gesture by which it empties out. This is the dialectical conception of the kingdom of heaven. And now if we put it back in a formal structure, you can see how these three parables are in dialogue with each other. The first parable, the parable of the mustard seed, lays out a simple, temporal, finite, formal structure. You have the seed, which contains in and of itself everything required in order to become the mustard plant. And so you grow it and it starts small and it grows into something large. Then we have the parable of the leavened bread, which is that we have the inert material stuff of flour to which water and yeast is added. And this yeast creates the bread, the stuff of life. And here the kingdom of heaven is no longer likened to the mustard seed, which simply grows in a linear trajectory, but instead is characterized as being this yeast, this organic uh, structure that is added to the flour, which allows it to grow, this process of fermentation. In other words, the first parable likens the kingdom of heaven to a seed, which you have to take care of in order to allow it to grow. The second parable creates the formal structure of something which has to be introduced into seemingly inert matter. It has to be added. It is an excessive feature, if you will. It is the likening of the kingdom of heaven to a fermentation process. And finally, we have a completely different formal proposition, indeed a dialectical one, in the parable of the empty jar. Here we have something which fills up by means of being emptied out. And think about it. This is fundamentally what subjectivity is. If, if you look at the, the definition of the idea or the word or the concept of subjectivity, certainly from a Hegelian perspective, but even already for Kant, you see that the subject is a paradox. The subject is who he or she is, and yet is also only subject by means of being subject to. These are, there are at least two definitions of subjectivity. Namely, you as subject, who you are, the space you inhabit, your consciousness, and then the idea of being subject to something, that you are subject to something greater than yourself, to a god or to the person you love, to your work, etc. Of course, the dialectical proposition apropos subjectivity is that to be subject is therefore to be both that you are subject to something, 
And this is what makes you properly subject. It's the classic Kantian Hegelian paradox of freedom, which is to say, I am free, not because I can do anything. I am free because I have the obligation to do something. This is, this is, hey, uh, this is Kant's well-known maxim about freedom. Du kannst denn du sollst. You can because you must. That freedom isn't the opportunity to do anything. Freedom is the realization of absolute necessity. I had to do this. I was compelled to do it. I saw no other way but to act. That is what commitment is. Therefore, your ethical obligation is your obligation towards discovering that which you can no longer choose to, to do, uh, to not do, as it were, to make it complicated. Now, this Kantian conception of freedom, which is therefore already paradoxical, right? A, a conception of freedom that, that is essentially a form of being bound is something that we see continued into the Hegelian dialectic, the dialectic of subjectivity, by which the subject is how spirit knows itself inasmuch as the subject only realizes its highest formal position by means of achieving the self-knowledge, which is therefore the self-knowledge of spirit realizing itself. However, as I've argued in previous lectures, this is not the mechanical deterministic unfolding of a preordained historical trajectory by which the innocent naive subject does the bidding of the absolute overarching grand plan of history, but thinks of it as being his own individual freedom and passions, the traditional interpretation of the cunning of reason, the title of this lecture series. Instead, what I've tried to argue is that we have here a proposition, which is a dialectical theory of history. Now, to return to the three parables, if you want to put them into a formal structure, the first one is a linear temporal structure. The seed is planted and grows into a plant. In the second proposition, we have almost a Kantian formalism, which is that something has to be introduced which cannot be accounted for. What is introduced that cannot be accounted for? Well, it is the yeast. It's the organic stuff of life that works its way into the flower and creates something new. In other words, there is a subjective addition that occurs, or to put it in Kantian terms, a reason has to be accounted for. We no longer have the pure unfolding of the pure form in its essence, as you might have in the seed. However, the third parable, the parable of the empty jar, when it comes to formalism, introduces the idea of an anti-formalism, of, if you will, a formalism of non-formalism, which is to say the jar is neither full nor empty. It fills itself by means of being emptied out. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Hegelian terminology, you will here already start to, start to see what other people might refer to as Hegelian sublation or Aufhebung. This particular, not paradoxical, because paradoxical would suggest that you have two opposing poles, but antinomical movement by which something is precisely that what it is not. What's key here, however, is that it's not simply antinomical in a Kantian sense. Instead, it is, of course, dialectical. And here I want to make a brief aside, which is to say that to understand the Hegelian dialectic, it helps to see it in light of the Kantian antinomies. For Kant, the point of the antinomies was not that they were opposites, that they were binaries, rather that they were something which could not be relegated to if you will, a horizontal formal plane on which you had one thing that existed without the other. I'll give you an example. Excuse me. Once again, it's very warm in our apartment today. It's very, uh, it's very, very muggy. It's very hot. Um, hence why I'm per perspiring right now. What occurs with Hegel apropos Kant, is that Hegel essentially dismisses Kant's formalism. The very structure that Kant upholds, which is the structure of the antinomies and the idea of essence versus uh, reason and the objects in themselves, this is something that Hegel fundamentally rejects. In other words, Hegel essentially comes up with a dialectical theory of essence, which he correlates with the dialectical theory of subjectivity, Hence the necessity for 
a dialectic of history. Because what is history if not the overarching, over time, occurring, contradictory features of subjective action? And that therefore the proposition of philosophy is no longer that the highest good is the realization of man's virtue by means of being in correspondence, with, by means of which his, his actions correspond with the achievement of the highest good, which going all the way back to Plato is essentially the whole point of history is that we have a correspondence between the ideal substance and the subjective stance on his own becoming. In other words, the necessity of uh, 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 finding what Aristotle would later call instrumental reason, how your own actions become the vehicle of the unfolding of this higher form of divinity or pure form. Instead, for Hegel, they fundamentally don't correspond. It's not that the subject could grow like a seed until he reached the heavens. Think about it. The parable of the mustard seed simply replicates the platonic metaphysical uh, analogy of the cave which is that we have truth that lies outside the cave and we have to grow outside the cave until we are reunited with the pure form or essence. For Hegel, this makes no sense. There is no binary between essence and appearance. We only have substance as subject, as it were. And so the Hegelian dialectic, therefore, is much more akin to this jar which fills itself by means of being emptied out. And think about it, this is why love is so important for Hegel as a metaphor. For Hegel, love functions in the exact same way. After all, what is love if not filling yourself by means of emptying yourself out? If you have children or if you're, or if you're with a loved one, then the whole point of being with that person is that you are subject to them, that you are sub subject to something higher than yourself that you give and that you nourish. And that paradoxically, you feel like you're becoming the person who you were meant to be that you're living the life that you wanted to live, that your quote-unquote truth, to put it in contemporary terms, is realized precisely by being subject to someone, by living your life in and through and for them. And instead of seeing this simply as sacrifice, because here I'm very Lacanian and I'm instantly suspicious of the idea of sacrifice, because as Lacan understood, in a very Hegelian sense, all sacrifices nourishing for the subject, as it were. There's nothing more selfish than a complete sacrifice. There's no martyr who isn't looking for a sword. In the exact same way, to make yourself subject to someone is therefore to become subject to and unto yourself. And what's interesting here is that we therefore have three formal propositions in the parables. And to my mind also why the Gospel of Thomas is the most radical one and the one that can't be, uh, uh, can't be tolerated within a metaphysical uh, Christian proposition that upholds the idea of a divinity in the sky. I've mentioned this before, but Hegel's proposition apropos uh, 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 the crucifixion and the death of Christ is, of course, that what dies on the cross is the God of the beyond, that the crucifixion is a post-metaphysical proposition. Hence also why I saw this in the comments earlier. Someone said, why not simply relate this to the, uh, 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 to the, 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 the Holy Trinity? And, and of course, you can relate this also to the Holy Trinity, which I've done in other lectures. However, what's important here is that Hegel's argument, apropos the dialectic, which is therefore in conversation with the Kantian metaphysic, which is also in conversation with the Platonic metaphysic, is also a Christian logic. The Hegelian logic is fundamentally Christian in nature, and yet that is not to suggest, as many people interpret Hegel as suggesting, that Hegel believes in a kind of transcendental pure divinity, and that the Hegelian theory of history therefore mirrors that of an unknowable, mysterious, godlike substance who controls us and gives us meaning and purpose. Nothing could be less true for Hegel. Hegel's argument is post-metaphysical in a Christian sense, which is another way of saying that Hegel uh, accepts the most radical component of the New Testament, which is the proposition of a God who no longer resides in a purely heavenly, extraneous location, if you will, a post-metaphysical divinity.
Hence why, for Hegel, what dies on the cross is the god of the beyond. The transcendental logic by which we have something small which can grow until it grows into the heavens, the, the parable of the mustard seed, if you will, is therefore no longer logically valid for Hegel, certainly not after the New Testament. Instead, it's a dialectical proposition by which what empties out fills in. And think about it, I said this over and over again, what is the Hegelian ontology, if not, that the fall retroactively generates that from which it is falling. And that is the parable of the empty jar. The parable of the empty jar is, the empty jar is filled by means of emptying out. In other words, there is no substance a priori that empties out until it is empty or fills up until it is full. Instead, the very act of emptying out is what retroactively fills it in. To put it in Zizek's terminology, we have here less than nothing, something which is an excessive plus one precisely because it exists in this dialectical rotation. Another word for which is, of course, negation or repetition. And if you want to understand Hegel, one of the most important things is this repetition, which for those of you who are interested in Zizek, Zizek has likened to the death drive. Zizek's argument, which I've talked about in previous lectures, which you can find in my ebook, Zizek's argument apropos Hegel is that we shouldn't see Hegelian Aufhebung or sublation as this kind of absolute solipsistic machine in which everything is transcended into a higher form, which would be therefore distinctly anti-Hegelian because still attached to a pre-Hegelian formal logic. Instead, that within the death drive, which consists of nothing except its own neurotic repetition, psychoanalytic terminology, death drive referring back to Freud, Todestrieb, that this constant repetition, this thing which has as its substance only its own unraveling, as it were, is precisely the Hegelian dialectic, the Hegelian theory of sublation. Sublation is therefore not, Aufhebung is not, the movement from the seed to the plant, nor is it the introduction of the yeast into the flower. Instead, Hegelian Aufhebung or sublation is likened to this dialectical pro project, this ontology, by which the fall retroactively generates the thing from which it is falling. And that is the parable of the empty jar. However, we don't have to look at these ancient parables to see kind of Hegelianism avant la lettre, although it is there if you look for it. You could find it in many other examples. Proust has a really interesting passage where Proust writes about his joy of reading as a child. And it's so fascinating because Proust says when he was a child, he always wanted to read. In fact, he didn't want to be interrupted. He didn't want to do anything else. He didn't want to have to go to dinner. He didn't want to be interrupted by friends. Not that he had many, but he was also so focused that he didn't want to be distracted by a ray of light or the changing weather. In other words, everything in life, everything which he was told he was missing out on, was in fact something that was conducive uh, sorry, everything that he was told was missing out on was exactly something that he wanted to avoid. He wanted to live his life in and through books. But here's the interesting thing. Proust writes, as, as a grown man, that when he thinks back to his childhood, he doesn't actually remember what was in those books. Instead, he remembers his surroundings, the places he lived, through those books. It's a fascinating idea, very closely related to the idea of the parallax view, which is again one of Lacan and Zizek's obsessions, which is that Proust as a young man was trying to avoid his surroundings so that he could read undisturbed. And yet fundamentally his recollection of childhood is of all those very surroundings that he was trying to blend out. And this creates the very Proustian suggestion that the only way to really remember his surroundings is to know them through the books he read, which he can no longer remember. Therefore, his recollection isn't the recollection of his youthful surroundings, nor is it the recollection of the time, uh, of the content of the books. Instead, it is the recollection of the time spent avoiding distractions, which he recalls so vividly and which bring alive for him all the surroundings of his youth.
Here we have again a dialectical proposition, except this time it's a modernist or proto-modernist literary poetic expression of the dialectic between time and space. Namely, the subjective stance of young Proust was to escape his surroundings by means of delving into literature. And yet, as Proust himself very clearly says, this was no escapism. He wasn't leaving the world behind in order to escape into his books, a very contemporary conception of literature. Instead, he was realizing his surroundings more fully. He was living his life and his surroundings more completely by diving into said books. Therefore, the act of reading is no longer an escapist gesture, even though it leaves behind the subjective focus on one's surroundings. Instead, the act of reading heightens his perception of that which he is trying to blend out. Here again, we have a totally dialectical proposition, a formal proposition which is akin to that of the empty jar, which is to say that Proust accessed his surroundings by means of not looking at them directly. It's a little bit like, imagine that you have a period of life where you're constantly listening to one CD or one record, one piece of music, Spotify, whatever. And years later, you can only think of that place when you listen to that music. In a sense, this music therefore triggers that recollection for you, which means that when you were listening to the music, you weren't trying to escape your surroundings. You were locking your surroundings into a part of your brain that can only be accessed through music. Now, of course, today, scientifically, we can actually prove that a lot of this is true, that, for example, memories are triggered or related to smells, that we can smell something that takes us back. And yet even this would be too formulaic for Proust. The famous Proustian proposition of the Madeline that is dipped into the tea isn't about, oh, I can evoke my past by means of dipping a little pastry into some hot water. It would be kitschy, it would be, uh, it, it would be sentimental. And Proust isn't sentimental, if anything. Instead, if you read the passage of the Madeline, it's his surprise that this smell and taste brings back memories, but instantly he realizes that he can't repeat it. In other words, he dips it in again and he doesn't have the same effect. And so he can't control it. It's something that comes to him only by accident, only seemingly by complete contingent circumstance. And if you want to go back to like my, my, one of my favorite Kafka lines, which I repeat numerously, is that you can therefore only see the thing the right way by looking at it the wrong way. That there is no formula by means of which to bring the past back to life, in as much as when Proust was young, there was no way that he could access reality directly. And in a very Lacanian sense, we only access reality indirectly. We can't look at it straight. We can't look it straight in the eye. We can only look at it askance. This is the famous Lacanian, Zizek refers to it as parallax, but the, the, the Lacanian position here is anamorphosis. And Lacan's, I've mentioned this before, but Lacan's famous example is the portrait, which is actually hanging in the London Portrait Gallery, which I visited here last time I was in London, of the ambassadors. And, and the ambassadors has a famous anamorphic illusion in the corner, which is a skull. Uh, but if you look at the painting directly, you don't see a skull. You see what appears to be a very blurred abstraction of a skull. And yet, if you look at the painting the wrong way, in other words, if you look at it askance, the skull will look in proper dimension, in proper, it will reveal this proper form. Some of the historical musings as to the origin of this illusion is that the painting was propped up on a staircase, and so that as you went up the staircase, you would have seen the skull as you walked up. It's a modern version of a memento mori, or think about your death, think that one day you will die. Gedenk te sterven, as the Dutch put it. Think of your mortality, think of your death. And it's a juxtaposition, of course, in the painting with the bourgeois grandeur of these two burghers who are decked out in the finest uh, uh, refinery and livery of the Dutch Golden Age. And yet the point here for Lacan, the reason he uses it as an example, is that this anamorphic stance on reality is the only stance on reality, that we only access reality through illusion, through fantasy. In fact, that for Lacan, the fundamental fantasy is precisely the idea 
of a reality that exists a priori, objectively, untarnished by the subjective blemish, as it were. In fact, for Lacan, it's the other way around. It's that the blemish contains the truth. The distorted skull contains the truth, not just of the painting and of the society the painting depicts, but it portrays the truth of the subject itself, the truth of subjectivity, the necessary failure to see objective reality for what it is, the necessary, if you will, fruitful failure, the useless precaution, which for those of you who have followed these lectures for a long time, we did a whole lecture series titled The Useless Precaution, La Precaution Inutile, on this very idea. And for Hegel, to go back to Hegel here for a moment, the same is true from a metaphysical proposition, which is to say, if we look at a formal logic, a formal metaphysical proposition, even the Kantian one, which is already, already introducing a problem, a problem, an anamorphic problem, which I'll explain in a moment, we have here the same issue, which is that subject, subjective reason, is supposed to be the barrier towards essence. Even for Plato, the allegory of the cave is that illusions being projected on the cave wall by means of the fire casting images on the wall through the very backs of the subjects, therefore is the, to their detriment that they have to exit the cave, they have to liberate themselves from this. Hence, subjectivity is seen here both as the problem and the solution. The subject has to free himself. In fact, the Platonic allegory is that the subject one day is dragged outside of the cave, shown the truth, and then sent back into the cave to liberate the others, to make them wake up and see the truth. The Kantian logical formula is already a little bit more focused on this problem, the duplicity of subjectivity, to put it in pretentious terms, which is to say, if the subject has to exit the cave, I mean, Kant doesn't write about it in these terms, but for a moment, if the subject has to exit the cave, then isn't the subjective mistake necessary? If essence is out there waiting to be seen and realized by the subject, then in a sense, the subject has to go through error. The subject has to wake up. The subject can't be a priori enlightened, but has to go through the process of self-enlightenment and enlightening others. Here again, we can see the transition in the parables. The first parable, the parable of the mustard seed, follows the strictly speaking platonic metaphysical logic, which is that everything is already as it is supposed to be. The seed grows into the plant. The subject realizes his highest necessity by exiting the cave. The Kantian proposition already problematizes this and is therefore much more akin to the parable of the leaven, which is what extraneous substance has to be introduced for this inevitability of essence and its unfolding to occur in the first place, which for Kant is the problem of subjectivity, of subjective reason. I will repeat myself here. All you have to do is look at the title of Kant's most famous work, The Critique of Pure Reason. How can reason be pure? In fact, how can something be pure if it is already tarnished by reason, that which is supposed to be antithetical to it? How can essence be essence if the subject has to go through illusion in order to achieve it? In other words, Kant understands that there is an obstacle or a barrier, a barrier which the subject has to overcome. Therefore, the Kantian proposition, his response to Plato, is essentially to say, wait, isn't this barrier therefore strictly speaking necessary? Isn't this obstacle, therefore, a fundamental necessity as to essence itself? If the cave has to be exited, again, Kant doesn't talk about it in terms of the cave, but if the cave has to be exited, then isn't the cave, isn't the illusion, isn't the fire a necessity as well? Isn't the essence of the illusion, therefore, that it has to be overcome? Now we can get to the Hegelian dialectical proposition, which inquires into the same problem which is to say, what if the ultimate illusion is precisely the idea of the essence or truth outside the cave? What if the fundamental fantasy, to put it again in psychoanalytic terms, is precisely this idea of an untarnished, objective truth that lies outside subjectivity? After all, if we follow the Kantian proposition to its logical conclusion, which Hegel does, in fact, you could say that Hegel is more Kantian than Kant, then isn't the problem precisely that there can be no essence? that essence can't be essence if it is tarnished by subjective reason. Strictly speaking, therefore, can be no essence of the subject. The subject is therefore the obstacle itself, and now the obstacle is no longer the cave, and the subject has to 
pole vault over the obstacle in order to reach truth. Now the obstacle is subjectivity itself. This is the dialectical leap that Hegel makes from Kant, which is to say the obstacle is no longer the barrier between essence and subjectivity, the cave, if you will. The barrier is subjectivity itself. And now the subject, and, and then Hegel simply does the final thing. It's like a little reversal, which is if the subject is the barrier, which Kant already hints at through the idea of subjective reason, if the subject is the barrier and the barrier is necessary in order to achieve essence, then isn't the barrier the same thing as essence? Isn't that which stands in the way of the solution itself the solution? Isn't the problem precisely that which it, achieve, which it appears to resolve? And we're back at the parable of the empty jar, my friends. It empties out so that it fills in. The subject is this contradictory thing, which is both the problem and its own solution. The subject empties out and fills in, which is to say that essence empties out into the subject and fills in that which was never there without this emptying out. In other words, Hegel idealizes negation. And if the subject is the negation of essence from a Platonic Kantian perspective, then this means that he idealizes the subject into negation as ideal. And think about it, this simply means repetition. Repetition means that which repeats. Now essence and appearance, in other words, essence and subjectivity are no longer antithetical, they're not opposites. They're repetitions of each other. They're copies of each other in negated form. And so idealizing, raising to the level of N, if you will, the subject raises to the level of N the idea of negation. And so we no longer have that which is posited and that which is negated, the Kantian antinomy. We have that which is negated and that which is posited in its negation, self-relating negativity. Hence the parable of the empty jar. That which empties out fills in. There is no beginning that leads to an end, nor is there an end that leads to a beginning. There is only the self-rotating process of imminent negation, self-relating negativity, namely how the subject is the negation uh, raised to the level of the ideal, namely essence. And now subject is no longer just the barrier, inasmuch as the barrier is no longer that which lies between the subject and essence. Now essence equals subject, because essence lies within the self-relating negativity of the subject itself. That, my friends, is the Hegelian dialectic. Hence why, if you want to understand the idea of the cunning of reason, it's very helpful to look at the three parables. The parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leavened bread, and the parable of the empty jar. Each and every one of them contains a formal proposition, which is a metaphysical one in nature, about being and becoming. And it's funny to me that the third one is non-canonical because Hegel's dialectic, which mirrors and liken, is, it can be likened to that of the empty jar, is deeply Christian in nature, can only be understood, I believe at least, by means of understanding his theology, his theory of the cross and of the crucifixion. And so my goal today, if you're still with me, and I'm very grateful if you are, my goal today has been to try to help you understand the Hegelian dialectic and how Hegel's anti-formalism is, if you will, a formal proposition of anti-formalism. Not simply the opposite of formalism, but a formalism of anti-formalism. I think this is very important and very underappreciated. And so you could say something very radical, which I know will make people upset and disagree with me, but you could say Hegel is a formalist, but he's a formalist of anti-formalism. That is Hegel's system, not a system of completion, but a system of incompletion, of necessary constitutive negativity, self-relating negativity, of a subjectivity which is therefore subjectivity elevated to the ideal, not by going up the ladder, but the idealization of subject itself, the name for which is essence. And that is the Hegelian dialectic. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I apologize once again for the heat and for my perspirating nature. I, I know it's not very fun to watch, watch a sweaty Hegelian. That's my new name, sweaty Hegelian. But I'm so glad that you're here today. It's my pleasure to share these lectures with you.
If you'd like to, to, to learn more about all of this, please do consider becoming a patron. You can download the complete guide to Zizek on my Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy or simply click the link in my bio. I'm gonna be hosting a live Q&A session for patrons after this. So if you'd like to join me on Discord, I'm gonna be going live in about five minutes. I will see you there. All right, thanks guys, see you next week.